Afternoon, everyone. It's really cool to be here at Chicago Ideas Week. Um, a little bit surprising to me uh, that, that I'm giving a talk here on cooking. As Kevin mentioned, after all, I, I studied biochemistry and mathematics, not how to become a chef. And I don't think I would be here today speaking to all of you if I hadn't had a meal about eight years ago now at a small pub just outside of London, very unassuming place called the Fat Duck. You see, for me, the meal I had that night was an epiphany about what cooking could be and the role science could play in the kitchen. And it's also where I found my passion. So to really start off, I'd like to describe the meal I had that night. It began with this dish, as every meal begins at the Fat Duck. Now, for those of you who've never been there or have never seen this dish, this is the liquid nitrogen poached green tea sour, as you do. Let me uh, describe how it's made. It begins with the waiter bringing over this giant chariot-sized gyridon that has a cauldron of frozen air boiling away at 200 degrees below zero Celsius. Then takes a whipping siphon and squirts a dollop of what looks like shaving mousse out onto the end of a spoon before knocking it into that frozen air and turning it over and over in the boiling vapors for exactly eight seconds. Then strains it out, dusts it with a, a, a brushing of green tea matcha powder, hands it to you and asks you to eat it in one bite which is certainly a leap of faith. <laughs> and when you bite into this, it is absolutely fantastic. It shatters crisply, giving way to this luscious, rich mousse racing with the acidity of lime juice. And the best part is you get this condensation, this fog coming out your nose that makes you look like a bit like a smoking dragon. <laughs> certainly you know that the rest of your meal is going to be anything but ordinary. But this dish is about more than just theatrics. It actually had a carefully, carefully reasoned purpose, I later came to find out. Anybody who's had orange juice after brushing their teeth in the morning knows how awful that alkaline toothpaste can make orange juice taste. Well, that's sort of the problem we faced at the Fat Duck. People often brush their teeth or have a cigarette before coming for a meal. And so we put lime juice in the green tea sour to neutralize any of that alkaline residue. There is the tannins in green tea that help cleanse the soft tissues. And there's a small amount of vodka, not enough that you'd notice, to disperse any fats on the tissue. Certainly by the end of my meal that night, I knew that I had to work at the Fat Duck with this uh, chef, Heston Blumenthal. And I was lucky enough to do so for the next five years. Working the Fat, Day, Fat Duck was a wonderful place. The food we were cooking was exciting, and Heston was an inspiration to work for. He really became my mentor as a cook. And among the many things I learned from Heston over the years was what a talented chef could accomplish with his or her cooking when enabled by an appreciation of the science of cooking. Now, I was lucky enough as a chef to learn and cook with a team that was using science to push the boundaries of what was possible with food every day. But for most of us who cook professionally, this isn't how we get to learn. The way we traditionally learn to cook is by learning recipes and mastering their techniques. You really think of this as the craft of cooking. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, it's an important part of becoming a chef. And if all you want to do is recreate classic traditional dishes like, say, this delicious French pot au feu, that's enough. But Learning to cook through memorization will never lead to innovation. And for me personally, really great cooking should go beyond mere deliciousness. It should engage all of the senses, not just taste and smell, but also sight and sound, even touch to, to create these profound emotional experiences that are wonderful. And this is what I think is really exciting about what I call modernist cooking, because it explicitly tries to do this. Example of a modernist dish I uh, helped create at the Fat Duck was this dish. Now, we call this sound of the sea, and the important thing to know is everything you see here is edible. The sand melts away into the flavor of Japanese miso paste. You have the rich, uh, luscious texture of fresh uni, and the surf tastes like a briny oyster. But the real secret of this dish is it's served with a conch shell that has headphones. When you put the headphones on, you literally listen to the sounds of the sea. But it turns out, if this dish is going to transcend just simply being something that's very tasty, if it's going to evoke these memories that you have, of perhaps being by the seashore, then it has to leave room for your imagination. Because if it doesn't, it doesn't work for you. For example, when we had foghorns in the soundtrack, for a lot of people, the illusion was broken. Because their ideal beach doesn't have foghorns. So it's an interesting question. Where do you learn to do dishes like this? There's only a handful of places that have been doing this. Before I answer that, I should mention this person. Now, one night, I met a customer at the Fat Duck who was equally passionate about food and cooking. Now, if Heston Blumenthal was a great chef and knew a lot about the science of cooking, my co-author Nathan Mirvold is a fantastic scientist who also knows how to cook pretty well. And until recently, um, not a lot of people knew this about Nathan. 
Nathan's a little better known for other things he's accomplished in his life, like his work at Microsoft. Well, Nathan and I immediately struck up a friendship, and we often exchanged emails on our ideas of the way science could be used to innovate in the kitchen. So it was only natural that after five years at the Fat Duck, when I was ready to return closer to home from London, which for me was Seattle, um, I sent Nathan an email saying, hey, I'm, I'm leaving the Fat Duck. If you'd like to stay in touch, I have a new email address. Now, Nathan being Nathan, three minutes later, I get this email from him. <laughs> Crazy idea indeed. Um, about a week later, I find myself on his boat in the Mediterranean going to El Bulli. This is not your hardship interview. <laughs> and over that weekend, he tells me about this idea he has for a book that we should write together, because who else is going to write this? So originally, his idea was a book mostly about sous vide cooking. But over that weekend, we started bouncing ideas around about how science could be used to do new things, great things in the kitchen. And our ambitions grew a bit. In fact, we ended up outlining what became the outline for our book, which is Modernist Cuisine. And it's really an encyclopedic treatment of modernist cooking. But as I said, we started out a little more humbly. Um, we wanted to write about sous vide, because we didn't think there was a lot of good information about how to use this technique. Now, some of you may be familiar with this. It's used in a lot of restaurants, not just at the high end, but even steakhouses and, and, and middle of the road restaurants these days. But th not everybody knows what it is. So the defining feature of sous vide is it's about cooking at an accurately controlled temperature, often for very long periods of time. And what this makes possible is dishes that have never existed before. This, for example, is our sous vide cooked short rib of beef. We cook it for three days at 136 degrees Fahrenheit, and the texture is absolutely superb. There's no way to get this with classical technique. You might wonder, well, why would I want to cook ribs for three days? But it's pretty fantastic. When we served it to Stephen Colbert, he told us this was so good he didn't need his teeth anymore. <laughs> but as Nathan and I started writing about sous vide cooking, we realized we had to go back and to really explain it, we needed to explain an even more fundamental ingredient in the kitchen. We needed to explain heat. Now, I, am not, I, I did study mathematics, but I am not going to go into the nitty gritty details of Fourier's heat equation. But I do want to explain why this equation is really useful to understand as a cook, because it answers some really common questions we all have in the kitchen. Like, how long is something going to take to cook? How evenly will it cook? And why do seemingly similar techniques often yield such different results in the kitchen? So to tell, tell the story of cooking, we got a little carried away. And we went all the way back to heat and fire. Um, because we really wanted to give cooks intuition for the way heat transfer works. And we wanted to tell the story of cooking in a way that nobody had ever seen it before. So we created the cutaway to see into the cooking process in a way I've never seen it before. Everything from pot roasting, stir frying, to grilling. And take grilling, for example. It might seem fairly straightforward. This is something we all do in the summer in our backyards. We'll be longing for that in a few more weeks. But there's actually a lot going on here. And mastering all this, that's the art of the grill. Just to take one point at random, where does the flavor of really great grilled food come from? Now, sure, with a hamburger, great meat's important. But the real secret is the flare-ups from the drippings. This is a, a movie we shot. These are actually hamburger juices falling onto a hot coal. Those juices evaporate, and then eventually the vapors burst into flames. And in those flames, you're actually forging the flavor of grilled food. And they rise up on the hot air and are carried onto the food again, giving you that great grilled flavor. But the trick is you're also making soot in that yellow incandescent part. So you want to be high enough above it that you don't get the acrid, bitter soot on your food, just the flavor. It's also a good reason to, why you put oil on your vegetables if you're going to grill them. You're going to get more flare-ups, more grilled flavor. Back on the boat, we realized that another ingredient that was really worth explaining was water. Because food really can be thought of as nothing but water with a bunch of impurities. Carrots, for example. Carrots have as much water in them as a glass of milk, over 88% water. And bread, your bread might seem fairly dry, but it's still over a third water by weight. And lettuce, lettuce is a crunchy water bottle, 99% water. Understanding heat and water is the difference between great sautéed vegetables and mediocre ones that have stewed in their own juices. A friend of mine one day, who's not a professional chef, asked me why he couldn't make dry fried green beans as good as the ones he got from the Szechuan restaurant down the street. And he just moved into a stove, had a 
fancy new prosumer German stove. And, he, and, and, and I said to Neil, I said, well, that stove here is nice. It puts out about 10,000 BTU hours of heat energy. Uh, the Szechuan place down the street, burners are a little bit more powerful. They put out about 200,000 BTU hours of heat energy. And that's the difference between great vegetables and mediocre ones. The juices are flashed to steam as fast as they accumulate. So rather than stewing their own, in their own juices, they actually blister and char and give you that fantastic taste of wok hay. Incidentally, Nathan was thrilled that we decided not to shoot this photo in his kitchen. <laughs> Changing gears for a second, I want to talk about bubbles. Because bubbles are another really interesting ingredient. Bubbles make foams, and foams make texture. Now, most people, when I say foams, they think of this. They don't think of this. I'll show a little movie here. Isn't that great? Turns out popcorn's a foam. There's a little bit of water left in that seed kernel, and the intense heat of oil as it heats up, that water flashes to steam. One of the cool things about that is it expands in volume by a factor of 1,600. Now, at first, that pressure's got to go somewhere, so it goes out a weak spot in the bottom of the seed coat, launching it like a steam rocket into the air. It puts the pop into popcorn. But as that heat keeps diffusing through, the starch becomes molten, more, more water flashes to steam, and eventually, the seed coat can't contain the pressure, and poof! The starch expands outward, and expanding outward as it does, it cools down, hardening into a crispy, crunchy, delicious snack that we think of as popcorn. Now, understanding the heat and the physics, uh, the physics in play with popcorn it was the inspiration for this dish. This might look like a pork chop cooked by a caveman. You know, oh, why'd you put that beautiful pork chop in the fire? Actually, everything you see in this photo is edible. And now I'm biased, I also think it's delicious. The ashes, they taste like gingerbread spice. The coals? The coals are actually made from the pork roasting juices with nothing stranger than a non-sweet sugar and a little bit of kitchen chemistry, just baking soda and vinegar to foam them up. And then we put them into a vacuum chamber, as you do, and take it up to 45,000 feet so that we expand it out into this edible pumice glass that tastes like roast pork and has a cone feed prune in the center. I think it's delicious, but even if this isn't your cup of tea, the same thing can be used to make a better pork chop. We take the skin and turn it into essentially popcorn kernels, and we bread the pork chop in its own skin and puff it up in the frying oil. It's something I think a lot more people can get excited about. But we didn't want to just look at exotic techniques and exotic ingredients. We wanted to look at traditional ingredients in new ways. Take the egg, for example. Nothing too strange about it. And yet, seen slightly differently, you can do amazing things with eggs that have never been done before. This, for example, is our truffle-striped omelet, or as I call it, the omelet that will change your life. You don't have to do all this to do this yourself. You can ditch the truffle if that seems a bit too much work or maybe your pocketbook can't afford it. Essentially, this is a three-egg omelet. But by throwing away one of the whites from the three eggs, the texture is so much more tender, so much more luscious, that you kind of wonder, why didn't anybody do this before? And these are some of the things that we really wanted to explore and explain the science behind. But we also wanted to explain ingredients like this. Because for a lot of people, these modernist ingredients can be intimidating. Frankly, a lot of you probably go, that's not food. But in the hands of a skilled chef, you can create dishes like this. This is our take on Chinese soup dumplings. And for those of you who've never had it, they're these little delicious parcels of, of dough that when you bite into them, you get this intense burst of rich, flavorful broth and a little bit of crab meat. And frankly, that burst of broth is the best part of this dish. So one of our cooks one day goes, what do we need the noodle for? And using, it turns out, using nothing stranger than a hydrocolloid that comes from brown kelp, we basically can make soup dumplings that are nothing but that burst of broth. Anyway, uh, as I said, we started out with a book that had minor ambitions to be maybe three, 400 pages, mostly about sous vide. Um, we got a little carried away. Essentially, this is what happens when you don't have adult supervision or somebody to tell you you've run out of time and money and you have to publish. Ended up being six volumes like 2,400 pages, 44 pounds, four pounds of ink, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. but what doesn't get mentioned in the press a lot is, in fact, it took an enormous team to make this possible, and I want to mention a couple of those people. This is uh, Max Billet, who worked for me at the Fat Duck and came over to be the head chef. The mess you see Max making there is how we got this photo. 
And the instigator for, uh, by the way, there's a reason you don't want to use half a walk. It involves lots of fire, nearly burning the lab down, frantic phone calls. Um, but great photo. The instigator was this man, Ryan Matthew Smith, our photographer for the entire project. Ryan was the poor soul who had to shoot over 300,000 photos over the last four years to get the 3,000 for the book. A lot of people assume Ryan used Photoshop to make a lot of these cutaways. A little bit, but mostly we did it in the machine shop. This, uh, by the way, is right around the corner from our kitchen. And this is one of our instrument makers, uh, Ted Ellis, using a wire EDM to cut a Dutch oven in half. Basically uses sp sparks from a stupid amount of electric current to erode its way through the metal. Like to uh, say that we have half of the coolest kitchen in the world. <laughs> But of course, there was a much bigger team. At the high watermark, we had over 48 people working on this project. And it's really the young chefs who were on our team, Sam Fahey Burke, Grant Crilly, Johnny Zhu, Anjana Sankar, the people who don't get heard about. They're the young chefs who are continuing to innovate, push the boundaries, and create dishes that you nor I have never eaten before or tasted. And I frankly can't wait. Thank you.